Today we're going to be talking about the beginning of the network programming module in the course and we're going to cover a whole bunch of topics related to network programming. In this particular module we're going to first start by giving an overview and motivate what network programming is. Network programming and network software defines protocols that enable computing devices to exchange messages and perform services remotely. So that's basically what networking gets us in this context. We're also going to describe a number of different mechanisms that Android provides to be able to communicate from uh, your device to, to some server. Most commonly this server for the first discussion here will reside out in the cloud or on some networked machine. Uh, later we'll also talk about some other things you can do if you want to program servers that run on your Android device. But the, the key point here is what we're going to be talking about are communication mechanisms that occur across process boundaries. Most Android apps that communicate off the device tend to use TCP IP and or HTTP which are some protocols at different layers of abstraction that can be used to exchange messages and download data. Uh, and there's all kinds of applications on the phone that use this. So your browser uses this. Email, calendar, contacts, uh, MMS, SMS, all these things use these kinds of mechanisms under the hood to communicate back and forth in various ways. Uh, and there's lots of discussions about how you can learn more about that if you take a look here. There's also some IPC mechanisms that are part of Android that have to do with local communication. The so-called Android interface definition language, which is the way of defining interfaces and components that can span process boundaries on an Android device. And the binder framework, which is the underlying IPC infrastructure framework that uses various interesting patterns like the broker pattern and other patterns to communicate back and forth between processes on the same machine. We're not going to talk about that right away, but that's going to become a big topic when we start getting into services, which will be a topic we'll just start discussing soon. So we'll discover all, those, discuss all these topics in later modules. Okay, so what I'd like to do first is kind of give you a little overview of, of what we have to deal with when we think about networking. Why do we do it? What are some of the challenges? So there's a number of reasons why people use networking these days. And uh, a lot of this stuff is probably second nature to you by now. But, but back in the day, there were some interesting decisions to be made. And, and even back when I started doing computing back in the late 80s, there were still a lot of issues that hadn't quite congealed at that point. So some of the motivations for using networking have to do with making it convenient to collaborate, convenient to purchase things online, convenient to transact various kinds of business and, and relationships and other kinds of interactions. And uh, some examples of this, of course, would be things like file sharing, stuff like Dropbox and so on, obviously social media, Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of other things that we probably spend too much time doing. E-commerce, online transaction processing to buy various goods and services over the web. Supply chain management, trying to make sure that you order your, your hardware and software in a way that shows up in a, in a sensible time without having to use snail mail or other more cumbersome and long, long duration ways of interacting. So that's one big huge motivation, probably the driving motivation these days. Another motivation has to do with scalability. If you can have a large number of computers that are connected together by various kinds of high speed networks, it makes it easier to scale up your processing using various techniques like cloud computing or data centers, utility computing. There's a whole branch of uh, work these days on something called the industrial internet that's worth taking a look into that, that utilizes a lot of different communication protocols and network mechanisms in order to be able to control machines in various degrees of precision and accuracy and timeliness and so on. That's obviously another huge motivation. Uh, availability, another motivation. Uh, nowadays, it's very uncommon that computer failures cause you to lose connectivity altogether. When I first started doing computing back in the middle 80s and network computing towards the end of the 80s, we used to joke and say that a, a distributed system was a system with a, where a file server you never heard of before caused your workstation to hang. And it happened all the time. You'd be sitting there working away usually had a very important deadline and all of a sudden things would stop and you'd get a message saying NSF server not responding and it was just maddening. Nowadays because we have a lot of replication we can afford to mirror the data, we can replicate it if something goes down through one path through the network or if one machine crashes there's often other resources that can come along and pick up the slack. So you don't have as much a problem with a single point of failure. 
Another big driver for networking, this was one of the main drivers in the beginning, was cost effectiveness. Rather than having to have each person buy their own printer and connect it to their machine, you could buy a much more powerful printer that might be faster, might have color, might have better resolution, and so on. And you could share that amongst a department or a work group. And there are other kinds of things you can share as well. It's not just uh, printers, but you can share uh, file servers, you can share all kinds of other resources, compute servers, and so on. And networking allows you to do those kinds of things. So those are some of the reasons why people in the past have wanted to use networked approaches. Uh, as it turns out, however, networking for a long, long time has been very, very complicated. Arguably even more complicated than concurrency because there's a lot more things that can go wrong in a networked environment because a lot of the pieces you don't have full control over. Let's distinguish between two different kinds of reasons why networking is hard, as we did before. One reason is what we call the accidental complexities. These are things that we bring on ourselves by maybe doing the wrong methods or using the wrong tools or following the wrong processes. A classic mistake that gets used a lot in networked software is the application of so-called algorithmic decomposition. Take a look here for some more discussions about what algorithmic decomposition is. It's essentially a very historically popular design method that structures the software based on the actions performed by the system rather than the objects or structures that are more stable, more uh, persistent over time. Uh, a lot of people who have background in computing from the 80s and 90s tend to learn a lot about algorithmic decomposition. And if you read a lot of the classic textbooks on networking and network programming, they tend to use examples that are based on decomposition using algorithms and functions and top-down stepwise refinement. All of which we try very hard to, to not teach people anymore, but it's, it's pervasive out there in that world. Uh, another common problem, another accidental complexity, is people historically have had a tendency to reinvent and rediscover a lot of the core services, and components, and infrastructure in the domain of networking. Uh, there's a colleague of mine named Steve Vinosky. We wrote columns together on many topics for various uh, magazines over the years. And he has this interesting article on what he calls middleware dark matter. And middleware dark matter is the fact that so many people have built their own networking infrastructure and used it in-house. Um, at the time, it might have made sense, but over time, it becomes a maintenance nightmare. They can't keep up with the rate of evolution and enhancement that's coming from off-the-shelf solutions, and it's, it's a big problem. So those are some examples of accidental complexities with network software. There's also, of course, a bunch of inherent complexities. So there's the issue, the age-old issue of latency and jitter. The minute you start to stretch things out across the network, then unless you've got a dedicated, very high-speed network, that isn't going to be contended for by anybody else, you're likely to run into situations where at different points it gets very congested and very slow. Uh, for some strange reason, the subdivision I live in right now uh, has a real problem. In, in the evening and on the weekends, the bandwidth is just dreadful. And it just kind of sits there to a crawl, and you get that dreaded hourglass, and it, it sucks. Um, there's not a lot of ways around that unless you're going to use like uh, Google Fiber, and they, they, run it T1, they run a gigabit network right to your home. So the other issue is not just latency, but also variation in the latency, which is called jitter. And if you're trying to build systems where the right answer delivered too late becomes the wrong answer, you want things to be as predictable as possible. So networked approaches sometimes don't work, or shared networked approaches sometimes don't work in those environments. Another problem, which we alluded to before with the joke about a network server you never heard of before causing your workstation to hang, you have the issue of partial failure. Your PC, your laptop, your computer, your phone, your tablet may be working perfectly well. But if the network or the server you're connected to goes away, then some things may not be working and you may not get the service that you want. Or worse yet, you'll get some of the service that you want and the results will be inconsistent. And that's a real problem if you're trying to build systems where you've got to get data consistency in order for the behavior to be correct. So lots of issues with, you know, say, things like radar tracking in an air traffic management system. You really don't want to have things coming and going because you'll have all kinds of safety and, and security and mission criticality types of problems. It's also worth noting that when you write networked software, you have a whole new class of errors to deal with because it's not just about the functional properties, but it's also about things like the network becoming partitioned. And you have to write your code to be prepared for that, to do something sensible in response. What that is often depends on the context, of course. Uh, another topic which has gotten way more important since the last time I gave this lecture, which was about eight months ago, 
the topic of security is becoming more and more important. So uh, we've all learned, unless you're not following the news at all for the past four or five months, that people with very powerful computers and good access to, to the points at which data flows to the network can basically take a look at almost everything that happens. And unless you're communicating through Cherokee wind talkers or something like that, likely someone's recording what you're saying. And so this is a huge, huge problem. Quite frankly, if you want guaranteed job security for the rest of your foreseeable life, get involved in network security. That, that's like the, the, 19, that's the 2010 equivalent of plastics from the graduate. There's a bunch of editorials I've written over the years talking about some of these topics. You might want to take a look for more. OK, so to summarize, we use networking and network software for a variety of reasons. One is to leverage all this hardware. It's really inexpensive to get lots of computers. It's really inexpensive to network them together. Uh, about the only thing that costs anything at this point is the power to run them. And that's why people tend to put data centers near hydroelectric plants, because they get a lot of cheap power. Uh, in fact, I heard the other day, I think the Grand Coulee Dam generates the most power in the, in the country or something like that. Interesting little tidbit. Uh, and of course, the other reason is to be able to meet the quality and performance requirements of our applications. To be successful with network software, we've got to address these inherent and accidental complexities. So take a look at those. Take a look at other resources. That question will undoubtedly show up on the quiz, so be prepared for it. Some things we can fix by using better tools, better methods better languages. Other things are just hard, and we have to figure out algorithms and protocols and p patterns and so on to deal with this. And as we get bigger and bigger systems, these problems are becoming more and more pronounced. So almost everything we do today is connected. So it's, it's surprising to realize the extent to which you know, the air traffic management system is integrally intertwined with the power grid. And if the power grid goes down, then it's quite possible the air traffic management system might not survive. Or if the networks go down, you know, there's all kinds of interesting dependencies there. So these problems are becoming more and more important. And so people who understand how to do this kind of stuff are in greater and greater demand. OK, so that's a quick summary of the motivation for networking and network software and, and networking um, mechanisms. What we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about some of the foundational network programming mechanisms that are available in Android. And there's a lot of stuff in this space. So we're just going to start today, and then we're going to pick up and continue talking about this in later modules, or later parts of this module. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of pieces to, to Android, some of which comes from Java. So there's a package called the java.net package, and it provides you things like sockets and URLs and so on. Then there's also a bunch of other things that come from other, other parts of the Android ecosystem, things like the Apache, uh, the Apache software that deals with sending various kinds of HTTP requests and getting responses back and so on. And then Android also has something called Android.net. So there's different ways you can do this stuff. Um, we're going to focus right now on sort of the simple parts, which are kind of the socket layer. And then we'll talk later about some of the other more, more sophisticated, more uh, high-level frameworks that allow you to be able to interact with things like web servers and s put and get various kinds of uh, requests using web syntax. Under the hood, the HTTP mechanisms, which is primarily what you use if you program Android, use the Java Sockets interface, or Java Sockets API. A socket is a software endpoint that can create bidirectional, reliable byte stream communication between a client and a server. And there's many different variants of this, but that's one of the most common things, the so-called stream sockets. There's also something called datagram sockets we'll talk about as well. Sockets are a very, very common way of programming. They're kind of the, the lingua franca of, IP, of network to IPC mechanisms. Uh, pretty much everybody who does network programming at some point along the way has done some socket work either in C with Berkeley sockets or in C++ with tools like ACE that we've developed, or in the case of Java, the various Java.net mechanisms. If you look even deeper under the hood into the socket implementation itself, and we might get a chance to do a little bit of digging here because it's kind of cool to look at this, you'll find that under the hood, the, the Java socket implementation uses the Linux APIs, which are written in C, and they do this via the Java native interface, or JNI. So we might, at some point, peek down into that code. It's kind of fun to look at that. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Java sockets. So there's a, there's a bunch of different pieces to a Java socket. There are three primary roles that are worth distinguishing. And then there's a whole bunch of variations that 
fall off of that in terms of sending and receiving data with all kinds of different degrees of flair and, and decorations and so on. The most core thing is something that's called a server socket. This is used to wait passively for someone to connect to you. It basically represents a so-called server-side factory that waits for clients to connect to the server at a particular port number, at a particular IP address. And it works as a factory that creates a connected socket. And we'll talk more about what a socket is in a second. Uh, it's also worth noting that a server socket plays a portion of the acceptor role in the so-called acceptor connector pattern. We'll talk a bit more about that later. That was a pattern that appeared in the POSA 2 book. Uh, another piece of this puzzle is the socket, which is the part that plays the active role. And its purpose is to establish a connection. So you dip, typically give it a, a port number and an IP address, uh, an internet address, and it goes ahead and it establishes the connection. You connect to the server. And when that connection occurs, then the server goes ahead and creates a socket in response to the incoming connection. And those two pieces together will go ahead and communicate with each other. We'll talk about the communication in a second. It's worth noting also very briefly that when you connect things together, you have to give addresses. And they're called uh, INET addresses for internet addresses. And you use these a couple different ways. If you're a passive role, if you're the server socket, you use the address to say what port you're going to listen on. If you are the active role, if you're the, sort of the initiator of this thing, the active participant, then you use this in order to say what port to connect to. So there's kind of like a little handshaking that takes place under the hood to connect up everything and create what's known as a full association, which indicates the sender and receiver's addresses. And that information is exchanged between both parties in a bidirectional communication using sockets. Once everything is up and running, then you communicate. So that's the third role, the communication role. And that occurs between two connected sockets, one on the client's or one on the, the uh, initiator side, one on the receiver side. Once you're connected, you can talk in any way you want. The active side can be the client, can send requests. The passive side could be the client, send requests. But once they're connected, they can interact and exchange messages. And the way that all this stuff works under the hood are to use some variant of input and output streams, which are what we're going to talk about next. There's a nice chapter that appears from an O'Reilly book about Java I.O. that you can take a look at online that gives you a little bit more discussion of what we're about to go, go through. So the, the core pieces that you do if you are reading data is something called an input stream. An input stream is a stream of incoming byte data. A byte basically means it is just uninterpreted 8-bit uh, data that could be whatever it is. It could be binary. It could be characters. We don't really know. We don't really care. Uh, and if you've got a connected socket, then in order to get access to this data, you call the get input stream method on that connected socket. And it gets you back an input stream object. And then you can use this input stream object to read data. So as you can see down here, we go ahead and read from a, um, we read from a connected socket into a buffer of 1,024 bytes. And once we've got all the data read, then we do something with it. So that's input stream. And you can take a look here for more information on input stream. Then there's a whole bunch of other things that decorate these input streams. One thing is called an input stream reader. And it can be used to turn a byte stream, which is a pretty low level thing, into something that you can use to read uh, characters. And you can read them in various ways. For example, what we're showing here is we get ourselves an input stream from a connected socket. And then we decorate that, or we encapsulate that inside of the input stream reader. And this is using something called the decorator pattern, by the way, which is a gang of four pattern. And what we do then is we go ahead and read one character at a time from that input stream. Uh, and it, it, of course, will we'll try to buffer some stuff under the hood to make it more efficient. You can also read a buffer at a time. There's also an API for reading a buffer or a chunk rather than one character at a time. You can read more about this at the input stream reader documentation for Android. Then there's also something called a buffered reader. And you use a buffered reader to wrap existing readers. So you can see here we have a buffered reader that is going to encapsulate or decorate an input stream reader, which itself is going to encapsulate an input stream. And then once we have this thing, uh, it basically stores a buffer internally. And it tries to be smart about how it fills that buffer up so that you don't have to go to the underlying source of data very much, which could be a file, which could be a network connection, or whatnot. 
So it tries to buffer the data. Not unlike the way that buffered I.O. works in the standard C library or in the standard C++ I.O. streams library. So here's an example where we're reading data a line at a time, where a line is defined by something that has a, a new line or a separator, a line separator at the end. So that's how you get data in to your system. And there's all kinds of trade-offs between buffering and non-buffering. Um, as you start using higher level frameworks like HTTP, a lot of these details are pushed down underneath the hood. If you're trying to program more efficient operations, like let's say you're writing middleware, for example, or you're really trying to have a tremendous amount of control to talk to very specialized kinds of, of sources of input, like various kinds of image um, browsers or image renderers and so on, you might choose to use the lower level mechanisms. So once you get the data in, then you may also, or, or perhaps to get the data in, you may want to create an output stream so you can talk to whoever you're connected to. So an output stream is a stream of outgoing byte data. And we can obtain the output stream from a socket by using its get output stream method. And here's some examples of this. If we have a connected socket, we can get its output stream. And then we can go ahead and write some data to that output stream and flush the data. And we can either do that by writing a character string literal or literals, or we can create a buffer, fill the buffer up with data to our heart's content. Maybe we read it from a file or we get it from user input or someplace. And then we can go ahead and write that out. The key thing to remember is you need to make sure you flush the buffer to make sure it actually gets written to the other side. Something else you can do, just like we did for input uh, data, we can also have an output stream writer. And this can be a way of converting a character stream into a byte stream. So as you can see here, we use our decorator pattern to encapsulate a few things. And then we have some strings. And we write those strings. And we append the strings. And those things get buffered. And when we flush, it goes ahead and flushes the buffer. The buffer will also get flushed if it fills up. There's one other interesting type of decorator that's part of the I.O. mechanism in Android and Java called the print writer. And the print writer basically wraps output streams or other kinds of writers, like output stream writers. And it gives you some higher level ways of being able to send sort of commands. So as you can see here, we make ourselves an output stream writer that's uh, connected to, or it's, it is decorating a connected socket. And then we go ahead and we send the get request. If you see the get request here, that goes ahead and sends the get request to the server. And assuming we're talking to an HTTP server, then it'll give us back the data. So this is using this print writer to send that. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, use a buffered reader to read the data back one line at a time and, and put it someplace in some kind of buffer. OK, so those are the basic building blocks. Anybody have any, any questions about any of that? OK. So what I want to do in the next couple of minutes, and this is just so that anybody who's still struggling with this part of their programming assignment uh, will know a place to look for more help on this. I'm going to show some examples of programming sockets with, with Android and the Java uh, mechanisms. So here we have a, a network sockets activity that extends activity. And it's on create method. When it's on create method is called, it's going to go ahead and talk to an async task subclass instance, which will say, go ahead and connect to this web server. In this case, it happens to be uh, our group's web server. And we're assuming it is listening on port 80. Uh, when this happens, when you call the execute method, that goes ahead and does some stuff, culminating in the do in background hook method being called in the async task thread pool, or thread in the background. And what that does is that goes ahead and connects to the socket at port 80. Uh, we wouldn't normally hard code this in production code, but to get the point across and keep the example short, we just say port 80. And then we go ahead and send the get request using a print writer. And after that's done, then we go ahead and read all the data that comes back to us from the server. And we stick it someplace. We can stick it in various places. And then when we're all done, we're going to go ahead and close down the socket and return the data. So we're going to assume that we have something called data that we're reading raw data into. And uh, when we're finished, then we return that as a string. And when it's all done, the post, the on post execute hook method gets called back. And we go ahead and we set the data that came back as the text view to be displayed to the user. So that's how to use sockets. Now, pretty much nobody would program like this in Android. It's, it works, but it's kind of low level. So uh, a more common thing you might do, and, and there's a whole bunch of ways of doing this, by the way, but one common thing you might do is use a, 
a helper class called a URL connection. And so here's the same example using a URL connection. So in this case, we're going to do something similar. We're going to go ahead and pass in uh, the parameter, the, the URL that we want, that we may have prompted our user for, to the execute method on the task. And in the background, that'll then run. And what that does is it goes ahead and it uses the uh, URL connection. It goes ahead and creates a new open connection to that URL, which takes the data you passed in and makes a get request out of it. So it says connect and, and get the data from the server. And then we're going to take what comes back and we're going to read it back into our buffered stream, our buffered reader. And when we're all done, we're going to take the server data and return that. That's a little bit more concise. That's a bit closer to what people might write, although you'll see later, many people tend to use the higher level frameworks like the Apache.org, HTTP clients, or the Android.net stuff, and so on and so forth. OK, uh, none of this is going to work unless you set your permissions correctly. So make sure that you set your permissions right. And um, to do this, you can do it a couple ways. You can go into the interface builder and, and open the manifest file and set something to set the permissions that way. You can also just go into the XML file directly and add a uses permission saying, I want this thing to be able to access the internet. And if you don't do this, bad things will happen. And anybody who's tried this has learned that it'll crash and uh, you won't get the results that you want. OK, so to wrap up this discussion, Android provides a very wide range of network programming mechanisms. And there's a whole pile of uh, tutorials and resources that are available online that you might want to take a look at to learn more about this. We will cover a lot more stuff in later lectures. Uh, not surprisingly, there's a whole pile of patterns that underlie all these things. So the wrapper facade pattern, which is something that we had in POSA 2, that kind of describes the wrappers that exist in the Java uh, class libraries, like the socket and sock server class and so on, uh, server socket class. The bridge pattern, bridge pattern is used in the socket interface. Uh, basically, to be able to allow different implementations of sockets for different platforms, as well as in different variations of what services are provided by sockets. So you can have a socket that can have its implementation do some kind of compression, do some kind of security, and it all works together within the same common interface. There's also the decorator pattern stuff that we just talked about, having to do with the I.O. mechanisms that you see for the different input and output streams and buffered streams and print writers and so on. Uh, and then there's also the acceptor connector pattern that we talked about as well briefly. We'll cover that perhaps in more detail later in the course.